So I wanted to uh, clarify some notation from last time. We had the potentials that we calculated at M and N relative to the source and sink electrodes. And uh, so we could refer to the potential at M you know, relative to A and B as V sub M sub A and B. And uh, for N likewise. Uh, so we got these two potentials. 0.125 minus 0 0.375 and uh, if we just take the difference between those two we'll just call them V sub M minus V sub N. We get uh, 0.5 volts so <clears throat> the answer was correct just the notation was a little uh, uh, sloppy. So let's uh, get on to the tripotential resistivity method that we mentioned the last time. We've got um, we we went over this briefly. We indicated that uh, you know with the, uh, the switch box, you can change the uh, potential electrode measurements from uh, the center two electrodes, which is kind of the standard for the winter array, to perhaps this electrode and this electrode. So <clears throat> we can have it any way you want. In this particular case, we've got low resistivity here over this fracture zone. We typically would interpret low resistivity to be associated with uh, something that was more porous and wetter, uh, more permeable, so uh, <clears throat> wet, lower resistivity. But you could also have a fracture zone which would be high resistivity. So we're looking at the response here and we're thinking, well, okay, low resistivity, is this a good place to drill a water well? Well, is this a fracture zone? This could be some shallower distribution of resistivity contrast. So uh, so that that's where the tripotential method comes in handy in helping us uh, differentiate between what might be a shallow concentration of low resistivity material and something more extensive. So. Uh, also, the kind of nomenclature that we're using instead of A and B for the um, current electrodes and M and N for the potential electrodes, we're just using C, P, P, C. Current, potential, potential, current. So the three electrode configurations, uh, just referring to them in terms of the combinations, the typical winter array, C, P, P, C, the uh, We'll switch the potential uh, difference to measurement to between the uh, uh, second and the <clears throat> fourth electrode. And then over here, we take our uh, measurement of the potential between the third and the fourth electrodes while we have the current flowing between the first and the second. So if you have a uh, survey like AGI SuperSting, you can shift between all combinations of electrodes and convert them into apparent resistivities using the geometrical factors. We talked about how to get those geometrical factors uh, before. And uh, this tripotential method is um, developed for a four-electrode system. And, um, but it, it could certainly be used uh, you know, as part of a multi-electrode system. Um, so we're just shifting potential between uh, three different combinations of current and potential electrodes. And but taking a look at a more sophisticated survey using a uh, super sting, for example, we showed this before. We have this low resistivity um, fracture zone, and lower resistivity remembers higher conductivity. We figure that if we have a saturated uh, zone water saturated zone that it's probably going to have higher uh, <clears throat> conductivity, lower resistivity. It's going to be more porous, permeable, probably fluid filled if it's an aquifer. And fluids are usually more, you know, unless you're dealing, dealing with distilled water, uh, water in general is, is fairly conductive. So now if you want to practice your conversions here, we can um, just remember that 100 ohm meters to get that in terms of conductivities, we just take the reciprocal, multiply it by 1,000. So 1 over 100, 0 0.01 times 1,000, 10 millisiemens per meter. That would be uh, <clears throat> a pretty low 
conductivity, actually. So here we have this indication of low resistivity fracture zone. Um, it's interpreted as porous and wet. Uh, so it could be a good water well location, uh, more intensely fractured. But we only have this one measurement. So the, the utility of the method comes out when we combine multiple measurements. So if we take the standard Wenner electrode configuration as we have here, we see low resistivity. If we distribute the current between the first and third electrodes and measure the potential between the second and fourth of the CPCP configuration here, we see an even deeper uh, lower resistivity. However, if we inject current between the first and the second electrodes and measure the potential difference between the third and the fourth, we actually see the opposite. We see high resistivity instead of lower resistivity. <clears throat> and this is kind of the giveaway. This is why the tripotential resistivity method is useful for the location of vertical fracture zones. So again, <clears throat> this is the main diagnostic capability. We have these three different uh, electrode configurations which can be obtained just by flipping a switch on the switch box. You don't actually have to go out there and move this current electrode over to here and this potential electrode over to here, you can do that at the switch box, so easily handled. And when we look at the data, we look at the responses, you can kind of see here, if we were just looking at one response, we'd say this is, <coughs> excuse me, higher resistivity. Well, okay, maybe. Uh, they all three agree. Uh, over here we have lower resistivity, but then we have higher resistivity over here on the CCPP. So we've got this contrast between the CPPC and the CPCP and the CCPP. Try saying that real quickly. Uh, this is uh, just another example. <clears throat> so the area circle in red here, all three responses occur together. We could just have about the same thing, perhaps over here with a low. So lower resistivity, probably not a fracture zone may not be a good place to put a water well. This could be a good place to put a water well. So you should be getting pretty good at this, determining the geometrical factors. Um, this is the Wenner array. We know that that geometrical factor is 2 pi a, and a is a constant, just the constant spacing between each of the, uh, the current, the potential, the two potential electrodes, and the rightmost potential and rightmost current electrode. <clears throat> but the question would be, what are the G's for the other two configurations? So let's just take a look at one. Uh, you know, in the case where we have the CCPP, uh, we're just we just have to go in there and figure out what the distances are. So D1 is going to be the distance from the first current electrode to the first potential electrode. That's 2A. So D2 is going to be the distance from the second current electrode to that same potential electrode. In that case, that's A. So we just go through that analysis and we substitute in for the geometrical factor. We get uh, uh, 1 over 2A minus 1 over A. And from here to this potential electrode, 3A. From the second current electrode, the sink, to this potential electrode, 2A. So we have 1 over 2A minus 1 over A minus 1 over 3A plus 1 over 2A. <clears throat> Combine all these terms, uh, bring them together, and we get a geometrical factor of minus 6 pi A. And that's what flips it around, this, this minus sign here. Okay, so these distances, D1, D2.
and D3, D4. So if you're trying to get this uh, straight, come back and look at this diagram here. Make sure that you're um, uh, going from the current electrodes to each of the potential electrodes separately to get first your D1 and D2, and then your D3 and your D4. And then substitute those in, and uh, your answer should pop out. Do that for the CPCP -CP array and see what you get. And so we just leave you with that problem, and next time we'll take a more comprehensive look at a two-layer problem. We, we, may do, um, we may take a look at some of the geometrical factors here first, but we'll be getting into some modeling. So uh, <clears throat> thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.